now live as well, live streaming. Okay, Lori, whenever you're ready, I know we're a little bit early, so you can you can start whenever you see fit, and I'll put up the agenda for you. Diane, you'll start the agenda, and then you will send it my way for the application. And okay. if you want to take a minute to ask everyone who is staff to take the whole truth and not the truth. Okay. Where is so welcome to the July 15th virtual hearing for the Columbus Art Commission. Hi. I'm Diane Nance, and I'd like to have the other commissioners introduce themselves, please. Starting with Chip. Chip Sander, hello. Mary. Mary Gray, hello. Eliza. Hello, Eliza Ho. Matthew. Hello, this is Matthew Moore. Marine. Marine Vander, hi, and hi. And Lisa. Hello, everyone. Lori Badro is our staff um, wizard. Oh, sorry, I said that, didn't I? Um, so, Lori, um, do you need me to swear you in? Yeah, you can actually, I think everyone is here. If you want to swear me in and ask the people who will be speaking. Um, if they can come online and be sworn in at the same time. All right. Don't need to be sworn in. Okay. Um, may I ask who else besides um, Mark um, Riegelman? Amanda Golden. Okay. Amanda Golden. Josh Lapp. Um, Timothy Middle. And Dan Wayton was here, but he's gone. Okay. Um, yeah, does he have a speaker slip? I'm, no, they're I'm staff. Really they're here for the preliminary project discussion. Oh, there he is. Dan's oh. here. So, um, uh, Tim, Dan, um, Amanda, and Josh, if you could come off mute so that you can um, be sworn in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So I am asking you to affirm that you will speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And would you just say your name and your answer? Amir will be here in 10 minutes. Okay. Mark Riegelman, yes, I swear. Thank you. Amanda Golden, yes, I swear. Thank you. Josh Lapp, yes. Thank you. Tim Little, Great yes. Way. Great, thank you. And Lori Budrow, I swear as well. Okay. Great. And if is there another speaker with a speaker slip that we need to wait to enter? No. Okay. No. All right, we'll get to commission business. Uh, our next scheduled commission hearing is September 16th at 2020 at 3:30. It will be a WebEx hearing. And there is a website online uh, at our Columbus Art Commission site that can tell you more about that meeting. The approval of the hearing summaries, I will um, entertain motions for June 17th and then June 24th separately. If the committee has commission has already had time to look at June 17th, I'll take a motion to approve. I'll move, Diane. Approval? Yeah. I'll second, Mary Gray. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, oh, we have to do a roll call. I'm sorry. Chip? Yes. Mary? Aye. Eliza? Aye. Matthew? Aye, muted. Hi. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. And Lisa? Hi. 
and I myself. So those are moved and approved. Um, the next set of hearing summaries is June 24th, 2020, and I will take a motion for approval of that. I'll move again. Second, Marine. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, I will call the roll. Um, in the same order, I'll try to mix, mix it up later. Uh, Chip? Aye. Mary? Aye. Eliza? Aye. Matthew? Aye. And? Yes, aye. Lisa? Myself as an aye. All right, I think we are ready, Lori, for the first application. <clears throat> Lori. <laughs> Make sure you're not on mute, Lori. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay, so we're excited to be back with this project. It started, um, gosh, back in, um, I think, 2018. Um, and it is a the first um, percent for art streetscape project that we've done here in the city of Columbus. It's associated with the high street streetscape project that goes ninth, I believe, not ninth, but goes from the Southern University District into the short north um, to the convention center. Um, we retain designing local. They um, engaged in a very um, interactive planning process with community and interested um, parties about um, ideas around public art for that area. Um, they also worked with uh, the public service department to identify uh, areas that could be presented to artists as potential locations for public art. There was a, a, an artist call um, and a uh, diverse and um, I think uh, very um, astute uh, group of individuals, including Mary Gray from our commission, sat on the artist selection panel. And um, ultimately, Mark Regelman, who's here with us today, was the artist that was selected as the Art on High uh, artist. Uh, Mark had presented a proposal. Um, people love the idea behind it and the enthusiasm and the research and just the creativity that went into it and requested some refinements. So Mark went back to the drawing board and came up with the proposal that was returned to the commission in August of uh, 2019, that uh, Columbus Crystals, the Maker's Monument. Once the commission uh, conceptually approved the project in uh, 2019, we went into contract with Mark and um, he started working on the details, the development documents, the project engineering, the design details, schematics and placement information. And I think as Mark can attest, it was kind of a high, handful in that particular location at um, West Hubbard and High Street. Um, one of part of the project was putting things under the ground. So when you're putting something large, a public art piece on, on top of the ground, you have to um, work pretty hard not to run into anything underneath the ground with footers and engineering. And I, and I just want to commend Mark for his tenacity and um, his work with um, public service and with the engineering firms and professionals that he's been working with to um, get this piece properly cited and um, engineered for the location and for the design itself. Um, I'll let Mark um, pick up uh, on this, but I just want to say that we received a letter of support from Michelle Brandt, uh, Brandt Roberts Gallery on High Street in the Short North, um, speaking very highly of Mark and his public art proposal. The Short North Business Association has also expressed their support for the proposal. They've been engaged and I've also spoken um, and been in touch with the people who are closest to the installation site 
uh, for this piece at uh, Greystone, and uh, they're very excited about it as well. So with that, I think I'd like to turn it over to Mark, if you're ready. Yes, I am ready, and I think, Alex, did you just give me uh, control? Yep, so you can share, share away. Let me know if you can see my screen now. Uh, the, the first page of the presentation should be up, just if you could confirm. Yes. Fantastic. OK, well, I can't see your faces. So if you're making dirty looks or funny faces, I won't be able to acknowledge it uh, at this point. So I thank you all for having me. It's, it's good to see old faces and new ones. Uh, it's only been a year since we met last, but it feels like 11. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the background on this project to make sure that we're, we're all on even footing before I jump into the artwork details. So um, project site overview. Okay, this is the easiest one. Uh, the heart of it all, the heart of the Midwest, Columbus, Ohio, that's where this artwork is going. When I came into the project, there were a number of locations um, kind of predetermined as, as um, good locations. So I went through all of them looking for one that I thought would contribute to the artwork best. And I selected the um, site at Hubbard and High. This site was good for a number of reasons, primarily because the sidewalk here, the right of way was the largest section of sidewalk on any of the potential locations. And so that just allowed a lot of flexibility for kind of a monumental work to exist um, while not interrupting the flow of pedestrian traffic um, significantly. I also uh, like this the, this location because there is um, a parking lot directly behind the artwork, and I thought that depth of field was ideal from a, a kind of a vantage point perspective. Also, the as you see the artwork, whether you're looking north or looking south, I think as you're looking north, uh, the artwork will be framed by the graystone building, and I think the kind of patina and natural ivy on the facade will complement and contrast the artwork nicely. Whereas when you're looking south, you're seeing more of uh, downtown area. And so the artwork just has a, kind of a unique conversation as you view it from different vantage points. So this uh, site was kind of ideal. From the very beginning, uh, kind of during the RFQ stage and initial conversations, I put together a handful of keywords. This again, just helps frame the artwork and frame the development of the artwork and something that I can continue looking back to to make sure that uh, these boxes are checked. So welcoming, stimulate conversation, reference site history, speak to diversity, front door to Columbus, progressive, share a story, timeless, taking risks, and bold. Uh, from there, I jump into project site research. I'm showing a very small snippet of site research, uh, but it was many months of, um, of kind of delving into the identity of Columbus and in the, in the history of this area. Um, area. So mound builders is the first thing I'm going to show. These are just incredible land sculptures um, that existed you know, long before modern society um, and are just brilliant parts of the Midwest landscape, the ones that, that still exist. Also thinking about the Columbus Railroad um, and, and the rail lines moving through Columbus, this is arguably the single most important event for Columbus's population increase and in, in economic prosperity. Uh, it was also described that Columbus was like the center of a wheel with the spokes being rail lines extending 360 degrees in all directions and really uh, making Columbus really the, the heart of um, America. Of course, looking at High Street just as a, a center hub of commerce, creativity and civic engagement. It has long been a place for people to gather and engage. Um, and I appreciate that, that that is continuing with the redevelopment of High Street currently. So during this research, I became very interested in what I considered Columbus's very unique maker history. Uh, so when looking through old archives, I came across this article from 1910 in the Columbus Dispatch. And and in this article, they had um, this Made in Columbus series. And they just list all of the weird things being made in Columbus. Um, and they also had these even weirder illustrations and graphics kind of accompanying them. And it was just kind of bizarre and super exciting. And the list went on and on and on. Uh, and, and I thought that this, 
this was something that was particularly unique to Columbus. So other big cities in the Midwest, Cleveland, Akron, Pittsburgh, these places were making things, but they were mostly making one thing. And Columbus was making an incredibly diverse portfolio of things with an incredibly diverse workforce. And so everything from toothpicks to locomotives were being made in Columbus. So it was just like a, 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 a weird discovery or a weird kind of tidbit of information, but I thought it really highlighted um, Columbus as, as a maker city. So I, I went through this list, started organizing it, typing it up in, in kind of highlighting things that I thought created a nice uh, range of objects. Uh, and during this process, um, and the presentation of this kind of conceptual or narrative direction, uh, there was a number of feed, the, uh, kind of a, a list of feedback that um, I thought was important to, again, make sure I check back and, and, and make sure that the continuation, the uh, refinement of the artwork um, was checking some of these boxes. So iconic vision, abstraction, speak to Ohio history, storytelling, engaging, ode to makers, accumulation, contemporary forms, surreal experience, day and night. Uh, so all that is background information. So we're going to take a three second pause, let that soak in. I'm going to have a sip of water, Rubio style. And then we're going to talk about the actual artwork. Um, so that was the pathway to get to this point. And from here, we're going to uh, kind of get into the, uh, in, into the development. Um, I'm going to start with my NPR voice and just reread this. I'm sure you've all read it, but this is like kind of a nice tight thesis about the artwork. The history of making and manufacturing in Columbus is vast and influential. During the height of the Industrial Revolution, there were hundreds of shops and facilities in Columbus producing everything from toothpicks to locomotives. And while the objects being produced in Columbus has shifted over the decades, the maker culture in central Ohio is still vibrant and promising. It is this unparalleled maker history and maker future that is celebrated within this proposal. During my research, I learned about the indigenous earthworks cultures of the Midwest, the transformative effect of railroads in the region, and the significance of High Street as a social and maker hub. These histories and many others helped frame the lengthy maker history in the area. It was my readings about the neighborhood communities surrounding Columbus that inspired the visual language of the proposed artwork. The surrounding, the surrounding neighborhoods regularly referred to as black diamond communities provided the manpower raw material and fuel that powered Columbus to greatness. Collaboratively, this region created a powerful manufacturing epicenter that reshaped the nation. The proposal titled Columbus Crystals, the Maker's Monument intends to capture robust maker history in the region. The massive metal crystalline structure is comprised of thousands of Columbus made objects and highlights this manufacturing history while its explosive contemporary form and refined surfaces look towards Columbus's promising maker future. Let's make. Okay, so now we're going to get into it. Uh, artwork. So this is uh, kind of an artwork without too much context. We're not thinking sight right here. We're just thinking about overall form. So strong diagonal um, cantilever. I wanted to, to really contrast the kind of rigid um, structure of uh, the landscape on High Street. Also, you can start seeing it's perforated in, in, in lacy facade, start understanding a bit of scale. Um, so we're going to get into all these details more, but just to kind of get you get your footing into what we're what we're talking about visually um, so let's talk about the objects first from the many hundreds of objects being made in columbus i went through and selected 50 based on importance um, their ability to highlight the vastness of things being made and um, based on a very clean profile so i took those objects and we created um, uh, graphics for each one um, and again this range from boots to ice cream to brooms to rocking horses pianos pennants, bottles, cars, uh, and everything in between. The next step was to work with a computational designer. Uh, and this was one of the more challenging parts of the project, uh, working with a computational designer to figure out a way to take these 50 objects and distribute them evenly across large surfaces. Um, this was uh, further complicated because the overlap was very specific. We needed to have a very specific um, amount of openness, so 20%, to ensure that the surface was structural. Um, this uh, created a number of issues, as you can imagine, but then that became even more challenging when you're trying to disperse these objects evenly over a complicated geometric surface. Um, again, the goal with the disbursement was to make sure that there weren't any places that felt um, kind of heavy. We were thinking kind of very Jackson Pollock painted, evenly dispersed over very, very large surfaces. Um, 
the primary goal visually with this was from a distance, I wanted the artwork to feel, while it's monumental, wanted it to feel light and airy. I wanted light to be able to pass through it. So that's why the skin is structural and the, the, there isn't a need for internal structural members. I wanted light to be able to pass through it. As you're walking from a distance, I want you to see light passing through it. I want it to feel airy. And then as you come close to the artwork, you start discovering the second layer, and that is all the objects that makes up the skin. And so the, while there's only 50 individual objects, there's eight th over 8,000 total objects that create this artwork surface. Uh, during this process, we spent a lot of time working on samples. Um, so testing out surfaces, testing out spacing, arrangement, complexity, um, having a good understanding of how light hits the surface, thinking about well details, um, uh, edge conditions, et cetera. So really spending a lot of time working on, on samples and, and figuring out some of these finer details. Also, um, so aside from the pattern, which of course is an important part of the work, the overall form of the work is you know, equally important. So making sure that we had um, kind of an explosive contemporary form um, again, thinking about those communities around Columbus, those, those black diamond communities, uh, and, and trying to use that crystalline structure to create this artwork. So spending a lot of time 3D printing as the artwork is being refined and developed. Here's a couple of, uh, of site renderings that show the experience looking north and south. So on the right hand side with um, uh, graystone in the background, you can see the, the type of interaction the building and the artwork has. Like it's really interesting and the contrast is exaggerated. Um, also, you can see the building a little bit through the artwork. Whereas when you're looking south, it, it feels more like you're looking into the future for some reason. It has more of kind of a contemporary, complementing contemporary. And so uh, we spent a lot of time citing the artwork in a way that was very dynamic from all vantage points. Um, so regardless, of whether you're in a car sitting at the stoplight here, you know, you get a dynamic view or walking up and down on foot or bike, um, thinking about the, the various uh, modes of transportation and how to make sure we maximize that uh, visual impact. So before we get into the real nitty gritty, I just wanna uh, kind of, those, those renderings don't show exactly how the artwork is placed. Um, so this uh, isometric view, I think does it a little bit of a better job. The artwork straddles the planting bed area and the right of way. Uh, this was important visually because I didn't want the site to obviously dictate um, the artwork. I, I wanted the artwork to be its own um, kind of unique identity in the landscape. So I wanted to straddle this area. Uh, the, the, the structural footer, which will be at grade and below, that will be uh, done in a way where on the backside, the planter side, uh, it will be covered completely with mulch planting uh, plantings, dirt, etc. And on the front side, it'll blend seamlessly into the sidewalk. The six and a half inch plinth, which the artwork sits atop, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go into detail about what its function is, but it will be cast concrete um, and it will straddle again the planting area and the right of way. It will also be cast and um, uh, finished and colored in a way that matches the existing sidewalk. Again, I want all this stuff to disappear and I want the artwork itself to be the primary focus. Uh, we're also planning on having some artwork signage north of the artwork that will uh, give some background information about the artwork and potentially have some um, uh, illustrations of the objects to be found as like a decoder uh, of some sort. My dad thinks that is absolutely the cheater's way, um, but uh, we think it might help keep people engaged, keep people searching for new objects. So overall dimensions, this thing extends about 19 and a half feet in the air, uh, 10 and a half, or about 11 feet wide, 15 feet long. The uh, artwork is positioned, again, it straddles the uh, planting area and the right of way. It also, while this was important to me visually for it to uh, kind of straddle this area, it is somewhat dictated by underground utilities, of course, and also uh, distance in, in sight triangles of this location. The, uh, uh, the six and a half inch plinth has kind of a dual function. Because the artwork cantilevers over into the right of way, um, uh, 
ADA requires that any cantilever more than 12 inches and under 80 inches requires a cane detectable curb at ground level. Um, that is to ensure uh, people that are sight impaired can move comfortably through the right of way without any, um, without any issues. So that's what the six and a half inch curb does on the front side. On the back side, on the planter side, that six and a half inch plinth um, just creates a barrier um, or some distance between the artwork and the, the planting material. So there's less um, the likelihood of debris being splashed up during regular planting or regular maintenance is, is just reduced. The main artwork components, there are four main artwork components. The artwork itself, so that if you're looking at the top, can you see my cursor, by the way, when I'm doing this? Everyone's muted. Okay, I'll just assume that you can or can. Yes, you can. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so it, the artwork uh, is, is comprised of four main components. The artwork on top, this is all 304 stainless steel, 3 16th inch plate. So it is, it is some honking material that will all be laser cut, bent, and welded. Um, the, uh, the, the perforation, again, that's 20% openness. That was, the, that was the maximum openness we could have to keep this skin structural. That will then be welded to a half inch weld plate. And so that's where my cursor is here. This entire section, this is a half inch base plate down here. That's the attachment plate. This is the half inch weld plate. That is what the artwork will be welded to. And these are two inch by two inch, three or four stainless steel um, uh, spacers. That helps us give us our distance to uh, accommodate the six and a half inch plinth. These top two components will come to the site fully welded together. So there will be no on-site welding or fabrication. Everything will come on a super max wide load um, to the site. And we, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the installation. So we're going to skip over the six and a half inch plinth for just a minute and talk about the, the, the concrete footer. This is a structural concrete footer that will be um, sitting at grade and five and a half feet below grade. So it's about 10 feet wide, uh, 12 feet long and five and a half feet deep. This will all be um, uh, epoxy coated rebar will be embedded in this very massive concrete footer. Um, also on top of it, we will have 59 five eighth inch diameter holes. Uh, these will be for the uh, anchor sleeve. So we'll uh, use Hilti epoxy to anchor in all 59 of these Hilti um, anchor sleeves. So this, this whole section down here, the whole uh, footer, that will all be done prior to artwork arrival. So this will be finished, a template will be given so these holes can all be drilled, sleeves put in, artwork arrives, gets plunked down right here, anchored in. The six and a half inch footer I'm sorry, the six and a half inch plinth will come afterwards. So after artwork is anchored successfully to concrete footer, the forms for this will be put in location and um, this will be poured. Uh, just some general details about the artwork. There'll be a, a minimum of 3 16 inch radius on all edges to make sure that there's no you know, extremely sharp corners. All of this stuff will be fully welded. Um, all of the materials, three or four stainless steel, which is perfectly appropriate for um, this context. Uh, the entire artwork will be passivated uh, prior to arrival um, and after the finish is done. The surface finish, and we, we saw it a little bit in the prototype samples, we're going to do a, um, a, a DA satin kind of orbital sander finish. This is this was selected because it's just the easiest thing to maintain in future, um, and, and, and it'll, it'll allow uh, the city to be able to keep this work looking very, very sharp with, um, with very minimal effort and uh, minimal funds. There'll also be three access panels located at the lower portions of the artwork um, that will allow for uh, biannual maintenance to be done on the inside of the work fairly easily. The exterior, we can talk about some of the maintenance issues there um, or, or how that plan will be implemented but this is the overall um, kind of artwork details. The structural engineering was done by LED. They're based in Brooklyn. They specialize in complex uh, public artworks and architecture projects. Uh, the engineering was somewhat complicated because we have a, A, we have a cantilever, B, I wanted no internal structural members, so the skin needed to be structural, and we have underground utilities, so we have this very kind of unique U-shaped concrete footer. Um, but we worked very closely together and modified the design and the footer accordingly in order to make sure that it was uh, structurally sound and, and ready for fabrication. We also worked with Francis Crane Associates on a lighting scheme. Um, and so the end result was 
uh, to have three LED lights facing north and three LED lights facing south. It's a very simple approach. It will, be, will give us a lot of um, visual impact in the evening. Uh, there's some financial issues with this, but we'll talk about that when we get to the budget page. Installation plan and maintenance of traffic. Uh, originally, this work was going to come in, in several pieces in fabrication done on site, but we were able to kind of push the limits of what a, what a super wide load was on a flatbed. And so this now can come entirely fabricated. So we have one pick, um, one drop, and anchoring it all down. So we're hoping that this will allow install to take half day, full day uh, at max. And we'll work with the city to find the ideal time frame to make sure that we uh, minimize any disruption on the streetscape and, and on the right of way. There are a couple of trees in this area. Um, once we have the, the final utilities located on site, we'll determine if if any need to be removed, but it's likely that the ones on the on the northern side northern side of the planter bed will. It's very likely that this one, uh, and I hope that this one will be able to remain. Uh, we will barricade this during install to make sure that it's protected because you know these are young trees. In terms of artwork budget, the fabrication uh, the fabrication is going to be done by Bollinger Atelier. They are a brilliant fabricator located in Arizona, and they specialize in stain large scale stainless steel. Uh, artwork, so they are perfectly suited for this project. About 55% of the budget will be going towards their work. Um, for site contracting work, that is going to be done by Sutherland. They are a local Columbus company. They have been just a pleasure to work with, and they are going to be taking care of all the hydro excavation, all the um, anchor bolts, um, maintenance of traffic, installation of footer, installation of plinth, etc. Eight percent of the budget went to professional services like lighting design, conservation report, structural engineering, computational design, and the remaining funds are located in artist fee, insurance, travel, research and development, etc. So, uh, lighting and electrical. While it was my intention for lighting to be included in the artwork budget, um, site issues just required structural engineering, fabrication, contractor work uh, to increase. And while I was able to have the artwork budget pay for uh, lighting design and lighting plans, um, Lori and I are working with the city to try to secure additional funds to make sure that we can actually uh, put those plans, turn those plans into reality. Um, so we're looking for an additional $30,000 for the lighting. Uh, in terms of fabrication installation timeline, uh, this artwork was always planned to be installed by 2020 and somehow we are still able to do that, even with all of the um, slowdown because of COVID. So the, the fabricator, site contractor, um, they are ready to move forward, assuming that this conversation and um, conversations with the city in regards to permitting go smoothly, but we're uh, expecting this to be installed by December 31, 2020. And last page. Okay, so we finish on a quote, a place where things are made. Columbus Dispatch, 1910. I love this quote. I think it's perfect. Um, I'll pass it back to Lori and open it up to the group for uh, comments and feedback. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you, Mark. That was great. I just want to share with the commission that I did have a meeting with my administrator and the um, director of the de development department. Sorry. Um, and they're still looking into the increased funding for the lighting. Honestly, it wouldn't have been an issue if we hadn't hit, you know, this pandemic situation with COVID and the effects that that's having on the budget. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, um, but we can install the lighting later if we need to. It's not what we want to do, but if we have to do it, then it will probably just cost more to do it at that time because you have to, you know, um, uh, tear up parts of the sidewalk to get to pull boxes and to move those through. So it's not something we want to do. I think that um, the administration understands that it's not something we want to do. And so um, they're trying to identify the, the funds between now and when we would actually need to, um, you know, make a last decision on it. Let's have one quick question. So so it, it will not be painted any color. It will reflect light around it as we talked about last year, correct? Correct. Yeah, we did a number of, of 
um, color studies, um, and the work felt kind of too, it, there was too much too much of a power to it with color on it, and it felt perfectly kind of monumental and explosive enough without color. So the satin finish will also allow for a little bit of re reflectivity. Um, so as you move closer, the, the color of your shirt will be able to reflect off the surface slightly. Um, so I think this was the, the, the best way to um, integrate the work into the site. It also, this finish really in terms of future maintenance, I know that Columbus doesn't have a huge budget for public art maintenance. And this was really just kind of a guarantee for this work to be very beautiful five, 10, 15 years down the road without really compromising overall aesthetics. Great, great, thank you. Yep. Mark, this is Diane. Hi, Diane. Was there anything in the uh, McKay Lodge report that you want to respond to? Uh, no, well, uh, so I can bring that report up if you'd like to see it, or I don't know if you have access to it already. Uh, we do have access. Okay, great. So there was nothing. So uh, my experience with, I approach conservators a little bit differently. I, I try to bring them on board during the development process so their commentary can be integrated before it's too late. Um, so that was the process with McKay Lodge. I worked with Tom Podner. He's super, super smart. And so um, we went through the project, every single detail together and made fine adjustments. So. Um, the anchor bolt specifications, um, how we do the pour, uh, the uh, just overall approach of fabrication, the radiuses on details. So all of those comments were um, dictated early on in the conversation and are now reflected in our current presentation. So uh, th that kind of addresses the details. The maintenance portion of it, um, that's the only thing that I haven't spoke directly about in the presentation. Uh, but because we're using 304 stainless steel, again, it's a super, super durable material. It's it's probably the most durable besides 316 and bronze um, for this type of location. And they just recommend um, a, a biannual cleaning. And that's basically, you know, giving it a bath. And so that's uh, soft, soft bristle brushes, some soap, low pressure water. You scrub it down, you hose it down, call it a day. Uh, this site is unique because there is a lot of kind of corrosive things in the air being right next to the road. So it's, it's, it's possible that each year or every other year, or maybe longer, depending on how it, how it ages, we'll need to go in and, and, and clean the work um, a bit more vigorously. And that is typically done by a conservator because it's less like giving a dog a bath. It's more like, you know, using some, some harsher chemicals because uh, there's a possibility that it will tea stain over time. It's very common with stainless steel works. And so, he doesn't specify the the regularity of doing something like that, but says it's possible that it will come up and we'll just need to kind of address it as it does. Thank you. Yeah. Are there um, any questions for Mark? I'm gonna, I think. Yes, uh, I do. Oh. Oh. Uh, Eliza, you first, please. Oh, thank you. So, Mark, I remember, uh, you know, your presentation last year. So, between last year and now the presentation, can you kind of, like, you know, give me a summary of the design revision that you have made? So, how was it different from last year, you know, when we when we saw it? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there were a lot. <laughs> there, there were quite a few, but I just, you know, it, it, it would be better from you. Absolutely. Um, so, there are a ton, but all of them are, are very... Um, kind of finite, very small. So the overall appearance of the artwork, like the overall profile of the artwork, I wanted to maintain that because it was something that was like very strong and very gestural. So that changed somewhat based on um, limitations of our cantilever, um, surface material. So I think last time I showed 35 crystals or something. This Now we're at 25 crystals. So things reduced in some areas. Um, the pattern was one of the biggest changes. Uh, because when I showed it early on, I was, we were having a hard time figuring out exactly how to do it. And we're basically showing this mm -hmm. is what we think we can do. Um, yeah. So, so the pattern itself, the specific objects being used in the pattern, all that stuff was refined. Uh, and of course, all of the underground details. Um, so mm -hmm. again, to compare it to the last one, it really, the overall gesture is the same. The overall mm -hmm. narrative has been consistent. It's really been an issue of just refining each one of those details. So the, um, the, the quantity of crystals, the size of crystals, um, 
figuring out how to do things like maintenance and internal maintenance, so access panels, um, structural engineering, its connection to the ground plane, all, all this stuff you would expect to kind of happen between concept and, and design development. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I can see that the the gesture, you know, the the you know the silhouette, you know, is basically similar. You know, very similar. Is it the cantilever direction has changed? Um, it may have changed a little bit. I think before it was kind of pointing um, uh, north, uh, sorry, northwest, and so we changed uh -huh. it to southeast because uh, we uh -huh. couldn't have the cantilever go underneath the turn signal. So we need to make sure that I there see, was a yeah. clear delineation between the two. So it was rotated counterclockwise slightly. Um, but see. that's been the only real placement change. It may have shifted a couple feet here or there, but but essentially the placement is is the same. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your summary. Absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to um, first say congratulations on uh, on solving that computational design issue. That, <laughs> I, we talked about that when you were here last, and I think it looks elegant, and it and it, the use of positive and negative space will keep people really engaged. Uh, I, I think it's a fairly simple question. I didn't hear you mention it, but um, I appreciate everything you've done for safety, but uh, it sounds like it'll be a, a strong structure, but will people be able to climb on it and what happens if they do? Yeah, so this is something that we spend a lot of time thinking about and even more so um, in the in the current climate. Uh, so the firstly, we and I worked with Tom Potter on this at uh, at McKay Lodge to, to, to help address this. We tried to do the uh, crystal arrangements in a way that it was hard to get up. So we try to keep them a little bit more vertical, not having any 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 large angled surfaces that that could allow people to easily climb up. Um, also, the once you have the once you feel the samples, and I don't I don't I have this honking piece here in case I needed it. Uh, the the thing getting your fingers in any location is extremely uncomfortable. Uh, so we're hoping that j just you know, based on all these different edges and planes, that that the that the the interest of someone wanting to kind of try to scale this would be discouraged. Uh, so, so so then the next question is, well, could someone climb it? Yes. So there, absolutely, the way that someone can climb pretty much anything. Um, there are ways to discourage it. Putting it in this very visible location is one way. Making sure that it is lit will uh, be another way to help in, ensure that climbability is uh, restricted. Also, the long sight lines that we have that the site offers will be helpful. Um, and uh, so, so, but if someone does, that was one of the questions that Tom, Tom posed. Like, if someone climbs it, or if five people climb it, what do we have to deal with? Uh, nothing. The, the structural engineer took this into, cons uh, into consideration when designing it. Um, if 300 people are climbing on it, okay, we might have a problem, uh, but the average group of people, um, if, if they were to get a little bit rowdy, the are able to handle it. Um, in, in Tom's report, he does mention, because we talked about uh, the top of the crystals potentially wanting to um, bend inwards if a, a 300 pound person were standing atop it, if that 300 person, 300 pound person were able to get atop it. Um, and so he has a note in there saying that we discussed adding um, kind of stiffeners on the tops of the crystals if required. So at, at, during fabrication, if we see, you know, when we do some actual field test, if we feel like there is um, any type of flimsiness or, or uh, movement of the artwork, we can add in some stiffeners. It will be an easy addition um, and, and not require any kind of like additional engineering or anything like that. Uh, the, the material is, oh, sorry, Go ahead. the material is kind of so substantial that I don't foresee that being required. Um, but it's something that we have discussed during this process. Fantastic. I, I'm, I'm so glad you were able to address all these uh, considerations without compromising your vision. So well done. Thank you very much. Hey, Mark, it's Mary Gray. Uh, First of all, I'm just a geek when it comes to seeing all the drawings and modeling and engineering. It just, oh, it's um, really impressive when people say, why does artwork cost so much? Well, I'd love to be able to share all, all these uh, these slides with them. Um, I have a quick question. What happens if uh, somebody decides to drop some garbage inside? 
Oops. I wonder if Mark is still there. Oh, I'm here. Can, can you see me? I, I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, what what happens? How do we clean out if uh, yep. so items are that, dropped in? Yeah, and that's almost certainly going to happen. Uh, so we have we added three access panels. Each one is about um, uh, about 15 inches wide, or 15 inches tall, 10 inches wide, in three different locations. So north side, south side, and east side, planter side. Um, those will be um, uh, kind of locked into place with stainless steel tamper-proof screws, and that will give the 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 biannual maintenance crew access to the interior to you know put in a vacuum, suck out any debris. It could happen more often if it becomes problematic, but those access panels will allow uh, someone uh, with the proper tools to get inside and, and clean out as needed. Great, thank you. Yep. Does the commission have other questions of Mark? I just have one more. <laughs> so Mark, did you get to pick the planting materials? Uh, I don't think I have that much control yet. I think the, my, <laughs> my, my control stopped at uh, uh, tree relocation. Uh, I, uh -huh. I, I would be, I mean, I think anything kind of, you know, somewhat low in green would be really nice. Uh, if I mm -hmm. if I have the opportunity to engage with folks that have the control over that, I would love to have that discussion. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't I think know. So. Yeah, and and if you have any thoughts, uh, please let me know. I don't know much about plants, but I do think you know some kind of yeah. green life around the artwork would mm -hmm. be very nice. Yeah, that would be wonderful if you can also pick the you know the palette of the the planting. You know? Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. absolutely. That was weird. What? Okay. Are, are, are Lisa, that. are you about to speak? My computer, my computer froze. Uh, mine did too. I see uh, two Lisa. My dropped. Can you hear me now? I just logged back in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey everybody, sorry about that. Yeah. Do you have any questions, Lisa? Oh no, I don't. That's a great presentation. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. I agree. Uh, Diane, do you want a motion? Are you I do motion? indeed. Uh, I would move uh, approval as thank written you, on the agenda. I have a second. second. Eliza. Oh. <laughs> no, Mary, you go first. I, I'll second Mary. Thanks, Eliza. Let me read the. Um, the, the motion as we have written, it's for final approval of the design and placement of the original artwork, Columbus Crystals, the Maker's Monument, at the northwest corner of West Hubbard and North High Street in the location shown in the submitted proposal and construction drawings per Columbus Code, Chapter 3115.04 A and C. We have a motion and a second. Uh, more discussion? Any comments? I would like to say, Mark, that was fabulous. A great presentation, extremely thorough. I'm really impressed with the way you use the budget. And I know this was not an easy process this past year. So I, I really appreciate you hanging in there. And I think the work is going to show how, how much you have given to it and uh, worked with Lori on it. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I guess I'll call for a vote and I'll go backwards this time. Uh, Lisa. Hi. Thank you. Marine. Oh. Marine. Aye. Yes. Thank you. Matthew. Aye. Eliza. Aye. Mary. Aye. And Chip. Aye. And I myself agree to. That was unanimous. Yes! yes! <laughs> I think I could also say that we really appreciate Art on High project and designing uh, local. I, I, it was a, a really amazing project that I'm sure will serve as a, um, a nice model for some of the work that we have ongoing. So thank you, Josh and um, Amanda. I appreciate your work too. 
<laughs> so Lori, um, anything else to say? Anything else you need from us about this particular uh, application? No, I'm thrilled. I'm glad you all. <laughs> I think it's great. I'm sure I'll be getting yeah. contact soon to uh, cut a check. Which is great. <laughs> yeah. So I need that. Two minutes. My way, Mark. <laughs> Probably well, it's probably on its way right now. It hasn't it hasn't shown up in my email yet. Um, no, we're just really really excited, and you know we're doing all we can to find that extra money for the lighting. Um, you know, if we're already in it for four hundred twenty three thousand dollars, and if you know thirty thousand dollars usually wouldn't be that much, and the department is, you know, I, I think that they're trying to time and they're look for it. You know, right at the moment that we need it, so they can maybe scoop it out of something else and move it. Do it, they most certainly will do it. So, I think that's great. And um, Mark, thank you. It's been, it's been thank great. you very much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. And I guess we'll move on to other business. Um, preliminary project discussion. Lori, what's that about? Uh, yeah, so we should have um, Amanda Golden, Josh Lapp, um, Dan Wayton. Dan was also involved with uh, Mark's project, so thanks, Dan, for your work with that. Um, and Timothy Niddle with uh, Public Service, both both Dan and Tim are with Public Service. Um, they, public Service is in contract with Designing Local for a project on uh, Sullivan Avenue called the Sullivan Bright Public Art. Uh, and Parklet project, and um, I am going to let. I think Amanda's going to be picking this up. That's true. So the preliminary project. Yeah, I actually at will. Point. Uh, I just want to step back one one second. Um, it's a preliminary project discussion, just to kind of introduce it. They don't have any any materials for it yet, but just to let you all know that it's on the horizon and it will be coming your way. And Amanda, it's all yours. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. I actually, Dan, would you like to introduce the project and talk about, um, you know, how you guys got to this point as the department, and then I'll pick up and talk about our scope of work and then take questions from the commission. So you're yeah. unmuted now, Dan, yeah. so go ahead. Okay. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, so yeah, we are doing, um, we have a project that we're, we're doing here on Sullivan Avenue. This goes from Hague to I-70 are the limits. Uh, so several components to that project. Uh, one is sidewalk repair, driveway repair, and pavement repair. Uh, those are, are elements that are actually ongoing here this year um, and then uh, we also have in design, um, we have uh, signal replacements, traffic signal replacements within that stretch. We also have lighting improvements uh, that we're looking at doing, and we have some pedestrian crossing improvements that we're looking at in that stretch as well. Those pedestrian crossing improvements consist of um, a bump house on one side in the parking lane, uh, and as well as um, medians in the center turn lane. Uh, in providing a crosswalk across Sullivan Ave Avenue at uh, at unsignalized intersections within the corridor. So there's like, I think, 12 intersections that we're looking at doing those at. So, uh, so those are the infrastructure improvements we're looking at doing. And in con conjunction with that, we've, uh, we've, we've started working here with uh, Designing Local, and we're just getting started on, um, on the, the art aspect. So I'll turn it back to Amanda to kind of run through what we're looking at doing there. Awesome. And Alex, um, am I able to share my screen or do you have to give me permission? I'll give you permission now. I, I have the documents okay. that you submitted, but I'll just give it to you and that'll be easier. It seems like that's how we're doing okay. this meeting. That works for me. So now you should have the ability to share, share away. Okay, great. All right, are you able to see? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So as Dan said, uh, the Department of Public Service was, and I'm going to make this full screen. If I can. How about, is that better? Uh, 
little better. Well, sort of better. <laughs> sort of better. You're still not filling the screen for some reason. I'm not sure why. I mean, I think it's, unless anybody has any objections, I believe it's legible to me. I have a large screen, but. It's Let me fine. see. Enter full screen. It's still the same size. Oh, well. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. But. Well, uh, as Dan said, we have jumped on this project to really think about how public art can be integrated in a street real rehabilitation project. Um, and similar to the Art on High project, it's really important that we begin to examine all of the potential sites uh, on the corridor to understand what constraints are going to be placed on the corridor. Um, because in addition to the budget, as we all know, the the street and the right of way really dictate what is possible within these projects. And so um, our team started uh, thinking about the corridor. We've gone and we're going back on Friday to document all the different site opportunities um, so that we can begin to to understand where they are. Uh, we have a two hundred thousand dollar public art budget. Uh, and that budget is going to be all inclusive of engineering fees, product fees, all artist fees. Uh, and so we really are going to um, need to make sure that this project is tight so that we can get the most public art and the most art interventions for uh, what the budget will allow. Uh, I should also note that in this first phase, we are also going out for the Our Town grant application. Um, that is due August 6th, and we're confident that this project is a really great candidate for what they have been funding on their last two grant cycles. So we're hoping that with the city's contribution of $200,000 to public art, that the NEA will be interested in, um, you know, placing some dollars for more public art on the corridor, which we're really excited about. Um, we are working with EP Ferris to understand the the different improvements that they're working on, uh, as Dan kind of outlined, and they're going through their permitting process. And it's going to be important for us uh, to understand what site constraints happen as they begin to go through those different uh, locations. Once those locations and drawings have all been approved, we're going to be uh, presenting a plan to public service and also uh, thinking about what artist would be uh, suitable for those different locations that we have. Um, we are going to form uh, a curatorial committee in which uh, they'll help us kind of think about what artists would be suitable for these different opportunities. And again, we, we don't know what those opportunities are right now. This is just very preliminary. Um, and, and once that curatorial committee has helped us think about what artists we should be approaching, we're going to reach out to them, talk to them about budget, and um, uh, really kind of hone in on, on what kind of possibilities exist on those different corridors. Uh, from there, we're going to be coordinating installation, managing the installation, um, and all of this will take place in the summer of next year. And we're hoping by fall, we'll be able to celebrate all of the public art um, uh, installations. And I should also note that we are also considering some park opportunities. So what kind of uh, public space extension are we going to be able to think about um, with this streetscape? So uh, we hope that more public space is gonna be created with the new improvements. And so we're going to be able to think about how artists can well, the artists are really going to be able to think about how they can improve those locations uh, using art. Here are some of the potential sites. Again, these are just preliminary. Um, nothing has been determined except for the proposed bump out areas. And again, these are uh, still very much in conceptual um, phase. Um, and we should mention well, that this is a the the streetscape where these bump outs are going in. That's a less extensive streetscape project than. The art yes. on high. Um, yes. So these will be potentially smaller scale inter. Well, they are smaller scale interventions in terms of the infrastructure itself. Yes. Um, so uh, that will use need some creative thinking. Yes. Which we're excited about. Yeah, we are. Um, we're also considering, you know, what bus stops might look like. Uh, Within the scope is the I-70 bridge wall. So the overpass of I-70 is just there. And it could be a very interesting opportunity for something to happen under that 
under that bridge. Um, as part of the scope of the engineering package, they are looking at some lighting and uh, we hope that there's opportunity for it to be creative and colorful and bright and, and fun. Um, and so I think the possibilities are very broad here in this project uh, and, and we're really excited to get started. And I know that you guys probably have more questions for us than uh, information that we can give you at this time. So I'll kick it to you all. Thanks, Amanda. You're uh, welcome. Good to see you. Yes. So one question that I had right away is not very arty, but I was wondering where the $200,000 has come from to start this the off. Sure, the $200,000 has come from the Department of Public Service and it's within their project budget. And I, I'm sure Dan can answer that more directly, but I well, believe it's in the project budget. Kudos to them. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's correct. It's in our, it's, it's in our budget. Yeah, great. Commissioners, uh, questions? Hi, Amanda. This is Matthew Moore. Do you see more murals or do you see more sculpture or? What, what are you thinking is going to or do you want to leave it open? Well, I would like to leave it open, but the uh, the only location that a mural can really go is if you can see my screen, I'm kind of hovering here over the 70 overpass. Um, and if you guys have recalled, you know, driving that corridor, you it's pretty substantial. The the area there um, is large and it could make a really fantastic and large impact there right as you kind of come into this area. So that's really the only location that a mural would be able to go. Um, I should also okay. note that there is going to be coordination with ODOT that will be required to make that happen. Uh, and we're considering that as well. Um, we hope some sculpture um, will be integrated in there. Again, the budget is $200,000. So we have to be cognizant of how to um, create the most opportunities for artists within uh, within the budget and also trying to make a, a very large impact on this corridor uh, to match the level of investment that public service is making on the corridor. Great, thank you. Oh. Matthew, go ahead. How are you was, uh, well, actually, we wanted to uh, uh, further ask what local organizations are you going to approach or partner with to find those artists or is it going to be a mix of of national international and local or how do you see that coming together we have not decided that yet um personally we would like to see local artists uh play a major role in this project just given the environment that we're in um we'd like to see uh, you know those funds go to our community uh, but we have not, you know, set that in stone yet. But if that's something that the commission would like us to explore uh, very seriously, then we absolutely will. And I think one of the things that will help determine that too is, um, you know, ultimately with Art on High, we worked with the community to determine what kind of impact they wanted to make. And they wanted to make this mm -hmm. large, bold statement. Um, right. And it may be a different answer to that question on this corridor and so it might necessitate a different mix of artists but again you know it's we are open to feedback on that and we're really looking to make this a process where we're engaging with everyone to understand mm -hmm. what the desires are here as well okay. great thank you so much well all, all i all i wanted mm -hmm. to say is really just being a cheerleader um i think it's fabulous that that amount of money has been identified, especially for this difficult part of town. I think it's great. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm curious, this is Eliza. So, so obviously this neighborhood is very different than short north, right? So how do you envision the public, you know, input, uh, you know, how do you collect the information or like uh, the input? So would it be like public meetings, but obviously, you know, the residents there, you know, it is a very different, you know, demographic makeup than, you know, short north and, you know, how do you ensure public engagement, you know, of your project? That's a great question. And one that I, I think that we don't know at this time, mainly because of COVID. So I think that if we were to be asked that question outside of the pandemic, we would have a very specific answer. Our intention before, 
uh, you know, the pandemic hit and that was our reality for engaging the community would be to physically spend time on Sullivan Avenue and actually talk to people who are walking around regularly, which looks very mm -hmm. different than how we engage the public in the short north. Now, that yeah. is not really an option uh, at this time, but we do maintain a commitment to engaging the community. And it may be that we ask different community partners that are already working in that area to gather um, residents, maybe some business owners together that we could possibly do a phone call or a Zoom call or mm -hmm. you know have a meeting maybe in a vacant space where we were all outside that we could actually have those conversations. Um, a lot of our work mm -hmm. has transferred to from large community gatherings to really small meetings, which seems to work out well. And our input is actually stronger and more meaningful in those settings. So um, we are committed to um, uh, engaging the community in a meaningful way. We just don't know what uh, that looks like yet. I'll add that um, one of the good things about this um, neighborhood is that there is an area commission in place, the Greater Hilltop right. Area Commission. Um, so we, you know, we've been looking at uh, engaging with them as representatives of the community uh, and then other organizations like Amanda said that are doing work. So, um, yeah, you know, the opportunities are there. They're just different than they were before. This is Marine and I'm, uh, I'm very curious to your title, the title for the project Sullivan Bright is really inspiring to me and you know, it makes me think about light art, you know, like if you were to um, use the title as a general kind of um, strategy for for your projects, um, it'd be really exciting. I agree. That's exactly why we called it that. So I am really excited to hear that it resonates with you. Yeah, I think it could be mm -hmm. so special and beautiful and it could attract, you know, if done well, um, it could really attract people from all over the place to experience it. Plus, the added lights, especially at nighttime, would probably be a benefit, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good comments. Anyone else? Well, it's always delighted. I'm always delighted to have you back in the, um, in the process for public art, designing local. And thank you to um, the Public Service Department for launching this project very much. Yes. Um, Lori, do you have any other comments that you want to make or um, for this project? Anything that we should know that hasn't already been said? I would like, Diane, um, for the commission to begin thinking about a commissioner to serve on our curatorial committee. And you don't have to decide that today, but as you guys are talking and thinking about, um, you know, what the responsibilities of you all are moving forward, we really would like someone to serve as a touch point for us during this project. All right. This is Mary Gray. I just want to say that Amanda and Josh are fabulous to work with. Um, so <laughs> I, I would nab the opportunity if I could, but I the last one. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I mean, it doesn't hurt that we had Mark presenting today before us about a project that we worked on. So <laughs> he deserves the credit for that one. He does, yeah. Good timing. So, designing locals had a big day today. <laughs> we have. All right, thanks, you guys. And we will talk about a commissioner. I'll give them some time to think. Great, thank you. Thanks All so right. much. All right, thank you. Okay, Lori, what's what do you want to do uh, next? Well, I just wanted to briefly follow up with the email that I sent to you all um, mm -hmm. about the meeting that I had this morning with um, Mark Davilis, my administrator, and um, Mike Stevens, the new development director. Um, I, I, I was really heartened that um, I mean, basically I took the information that we had talked about, put a little bit more into it from the city's perspective and started attaching numbers just as a place to start. Some of the numbers came from the subcommittees and um, you know, some of them I, I did some guesses uh, thinking that when we get to things like looking at the city symbology, um, uh, the flag, the seal, you know, that's going to be a fairly big lift 
for it to be as um, open and inclusive as the mayor has said that he wants it to be. And just to kind of put that out there for them to, to think about and for um, Mike Stevens to think about in his interactions with the cabinet and with um, Mayor Ginther um, as to how some of these things move forward. Um, <clears throat> I think um, the takeaway that I had was that he was really appreciative of the work that you all have been doing in the small subcommittees to kind of wrap um, your, your, all of our minds around how some of this might work and move forward as starting places. Um, and, you know, he, I think, is going to be an advocate for, um, for the commission and for um, making sure as much as he possibly can that this is a, you know, that we get what we need to have a truly participatory process. Um, and, you know, just as we were talking about before, participatory processes in this environment are different than they were before, but we might have advantages in this format that we didn't have before because it's really easy for people to sit at home and dial in, you know, it's, it's not like having to get up and go someplace to, to participate. So that's, that's something that may assist us. Um, I think at this particular point, um, we discussed the possibility. I don't know if um, Mike will have um, it cleared on his agenda yet and have the information he's hoping for from the administration, but um, I'd just like to get a straw poll as to whether uh, commissioners you think that you could attend um, a hearing in August, excuse me, in, in August, yeah, in August. Um, I'll write the date down, but. Got rid of the paper here. Just grab up the date. Let's see. August 19th. Because we usually don't meet in August. You guys usually take that off. But, you know, if you are available, it would be nice to schedule a meeting in August just to kind of, as a commission, um, talk about the mayor's um, tasks that he's given the commission and also have some administrative input. Um, Lori, do you want us to do that, give that straw pool by chat, or how would you like to hear from us? Well, um, if you could just email me and let me know, then I can follow up with um, what I need to to get it on your um, your radar, and then we can get it in the city bulletin. Okay. Um, I, I know we've all been meeting, um, and you guys have all been really doing a lot of work. Um, I guess at this particular point, what I would suggest is that you think about um, maybe types of public participation, uh, ways of community involvement, and any kind of kind of cross pollination between the different subcommittees um, that might be able to happen, um, and just you know give that some thought. Um, and I think that the I think that they the administration has enough information right now to um start thinking about um what they might be putting into this and uh coming back to us with you know a, a plan that we just i think work out together um i hope that you all are okay with this but i kind of i made a decision on my own and i've been telling everyone that's been calling me that you know the christopher columbus statue is safe it's secure um and we're not we're not interested in moving quickly with uh, finding a new place for it. I think that, you know, things are still kind of volatile politically and it just doesn't make any sense um, to try and find a rush, a rush to find a new site for it. Um, I think we need to really give some consideration to um, the conversation around that. And um, we've talked about having uh, historian engaged with some of the collection uh, to look at it in terms of the artists that did the work, the types of the work, and maybe uh, we could also do something similar very specifically around um, Christopher Columbus. I know, Eliza, you've been thinking a lot about this, um, sort of the, the context of, um, you know, the, the symbol of the person, the, the 21st century um, context, context that we know about him now, um, the, you know, you've also got on top of that, the, I think the Italian immigrant experience, 
um, and the, um, you know, the Sister Cities gift and it coming at the end of World War II. There's just a lot of different things that um, I think need to be need to be thought about. And um, if we had someone to kind of pull that stuff together, I think it would be to the benefit of the commission as we move forward with talking with the various groups that are interested in what happens with the piece next. Um, I, I just want to throw something out. Um, you know, I have not been active in a lot of the subcommittee stuff, uh, which has been great. Um, and I don't disagree with, with you, Lori, about what to do with Christopher, uh, but as it seems to me that if, if there's a, if there's a professional survey process that can be really ubiquitous and inclusive um, uh, and would cost money if it's all those things, um, to deal with the flag, the symbol, and the replacement for City Hall, sort of all, mm -hmm. you know, just one, you know, I hate to use the word grown up in two meetings in a row, but you know, a really professional, you, you all know more about these kind of surveys than me, but it seems to me that if, if, if that is done in the coming weeks or however long it takes, the city pays for it. And it, it covers all three of those things, flag, symbol, and replacement. Then we have that document to share with potential artists on the replacement. It's useful for all those other purposes. And it gives an opportunity, you know, as opposed to multiple surveys or multiple different ways of doing that. And as you pointed out, we're, we are in this pandemic. So, you know, it really could, we could really have a lot of input. So I'm just kind of throwing that out and because we have all these different paths that as a commission we're going down, I'm just trying to bring it all together in one thing. You know what I'm going to throw in here. I, I think that's. Um, I think we're talking about in feedback, and we're talking about uh, buy-in from all parties. And I think a, a a general general public campaign that gets everybody's input is excellent. But I also want to propose that uh, key stakeholders are given. Um, a little more gravity to uh, their input. In other words, uh, Lisa and I have been talking on the flag subcommittee about running with an initial uh, general public campaign, but um, also doing a deeper dive with key stakeholders. And I think we've all seen crowdsourced projects go awry. And my goal for this would be um, that those key stakeholders are or we're asking them to go below the superficial, below, um, you know, the cliches and get at truly what we believe Columbus is and what it will become and, um, and design from there as well. Um, so I'm, I'm proposing yeah. this, a two-step process in terms of research. Matthew and Lisa, um, when you're thinking of uh, key stakeholders, uh, what individuals are you what you know? What was coming to mind for you? Well, we've already started a list. Um, I think we're looking at uh, community leaders, uh, city leaders. Uh, we're looking at business leaders, and then um, and then also uh, neighborhood leaders and um, historians and futurists uh, and people with uh, people who represent Columbus outside of Columbus, even like you know, honey or Jenny Britton or Jenny's ice cream, like um, different walks of life that represent who we are as a city is my interest in bringing to the table as stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's a, I, um, I see that Amanda and Josh are still on the line, but it seems to me we need an organization like uh, theirs to spearhead something uh, at, uh, on this scale for us. I agree. Yeah. Just, yeah, I don't, I my, don't know. Go ahead. My main thing, my main thinking right now is that 
I feel like we need to talk to the stakeholders to really formulate some ideas and themes that we want artists to design to or designers to design to, like <clears throat> give them something that's already some research and input from the community that they can take and run with and propose professional pieces from. So it's more I, than just us talking at them. Right, and I think it's, a, it's an, an organization or a company devoted to good research methods and can handle public outreach and can handle ideally would be an all-in-one solution where they would have talented designers to take what the public generates and uh, and, uh, and and design to that as well um laurie and laurie can you answer this question how long did it take to secure design uh, local for for the art on high project I and mean, what kind of process was that how quickly could we get longest was getting the money to do it um there was a lot of agreement to doing it but getting um the funding to do it um was what slowed a lot of it down and once we had that it was able to move forward pretty quickly um when i talked to um mark travillas and and mike stevens with regard to the um uh the symbol subcommittee um, I just said the first step is that, you know, there needs to be a commitment of funding to bring together a consultant team to then work with us, work with us. So that it's, you know, it's um, multidimensional, it's properly managed. Um, and Matthew, for your benefit, I have to say that I talked to someone today in Columbus who's actually a member of the, I'm going to screw this word up, but the Vexilog Vexilogical Society. You nailed it. I did, wasn't close, was I? <laughs> no, it was good. <laughs> um, so I thought I would let you know that. But I mean, I, I, I think everyone's saying um, things that are important, um, but what, what really is going to help us pull together is when we have um, the guidance and um, sort of the green light from the administration to move forward with putting together the RFP with our input, with your input, it'll be a city RFP, and then getting this team together that we then, you know, really um, sit down with them and, you know, bring these ideas to the table and have them um, bring their expertise to it as to, you know, how you get that input, the different levels of it, um, the research, the marketing, um, I think facilitation mm -hmm. to a certain degree might have to be in it design teams, um, you know, research and marketing, and whether at that time, Chip, we can also think about research and marketing for the public art piece, I don't know, maybe. Um, but at least we'll come away, I think, from this with a pretty good idea of what we would want to do for the, for the public art piece. And, you know, I think it's, it may be to our benefit to think about the public art piece as sort of a, um, um, a capital project where you know you get your funding for your design. So we get our funding so that we can work what we need to do through for put together the art plan for the artist call. Um, and then we get our money secured to actually go out for the artist call. Um, so it's sort of a multi-step process. Um, so, I mean, they've got these things out here. We're certainly in a, a difficult, um, I think, environment because of the pandemic, but um, you know, I, the mm -hmm. mayor's made these requests and we've sort of given some indication of what needs to happen in order to, so I think we just need to kind of wait and see how they respond. But while that's happening, you know, certainly keep thinking about stuff and particularly, um, the facets of, um, community input, what that really means when we talk about an inclusive and diverse process. Um, you know, particularly if the first thing that we bite off is the city symbols um, piece. Well, Lori, is the August, a, I'm sorry, hmm? would the August 19th meeting um, be to talk with the city about money and stuff like that? I mean, is that, is that the thought of that? Yeah, meeting? well, oh, I, I mean, if, if Mike is able to come and he's able to have the cabinet or then, yeah, I think we'll get an idea of um, funding and um, timing of these projects because, you know, they're all pretty big lists. 
and um, and also whether or not there is a priority that the administration would, would see from you know what we've been suggesting. So uh, you know we'll just have to wait and see. And again, if my meet with the commission in August, then um, if you're all amenable to it, then we'll just have a special hearing um, when he is able to join us so that we can have this conversation because I think it's really important. Well, should we, should we, am I muted? Oh, no, I'm not muted. Um, well, should we just do a, a straw poll now about availability on the 19th so you can follow up to see if that is even possible? I mean, I, I yeah, let I, me just um, get I my, I canceled my worldwide tour. You year. did. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, can't really leave Columbus without getting arrested. So, um, okay. <laughs> so Chip is available. <laughs> Diane, are you available? Yes. Um, Eliza, are you available? Yes. Okay. Um, Mary? Indeed. Uh, Matthew? Yep. I'm in. Okay. Marine? Marine, Marine's here? muted. Ah. Are you available the, on 819? Yes, not at three, but um, I think I can do after four. Okay, well, that's mm -hmm. Okay. Join us. Lisa? You could join us at four, I suppose, right? I mean. <laughs> I'm we, just, we just don't say anything important until four. <laughs> <laughs> we just well, talk about money. <laughs> we'll, we'll vamp it's like in four then. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Uh, anything else that you want to bring up, commissioners? Lori, did you say you sent an email out this morning about your conversation with your folks? Yes. Yeah. Did you guys get it? Uh, it well. What was the subject? It was right before. <laughs> did, I, <laughs> did I send something I'm crazy? Sorry. I was doing so many things. Oh, now I'm worried. Was it under public outreach idea? No. Uh, I don't know. City seal. I'll look back. It was. Uh, could I, it was could a, I? Mary, it was at two twenty nine. Does that help? You? Uh, at two twenty nine. I know RE city seal. That's today. That's this yeah. afternoon. So it wasn't yep. this morning. Yeah, it wasn't this morning. It was this afternoon. No, okay. I didn't get out this afternoon. I don't yeah. see the email at 229. Okay. All right. I will go back and look and see. I thought I sent it. Oh, you um, yeah. It was a really busy day. I started okay. at 3 in the morning. <laughs> Yeah, let me, uh, I'll go back and see. I know I spent a lot of time on it. I hope I didn't delete it. I really thought I sent it. But did everybody else get it? Yeah, I, I just forwarded it to you, Mary. Thank you. You're welcome. Ah, City like Seal. Oh, that copy. one. Okay, <laughs> but I was looking at the pretty pictures. Um, oh, wow. Hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. And now I need to go double check what. Yeah, I'm on there. I just, I did not see this. Hmm. Interesting. I think some email systems have a way of appending emails, you know, according to subjects. So maybe this is why this subject yeah. is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Cause oh, I was I looking think I at attached it to Matthews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then send it to everyone. You know, that brings up a good point. Um, and uh, and Lisa's advocated for this, and I've mentioned it before, but um, do you got anybody on this uh, use Slack before as a way of Slack? tracking communications? Slack, yeah. I, heard, I don't know. I have not. You know, what's great about it, and stop, Columbus is using this on a massive scale, but it's essentially, it's it tracks all communication. It's a... Um, um, project management communication tool. So um, all all communication between subcommittees um, is on, on record, but easily you can easily see uh, the line of communication. You don't have emails with funky headers going back and forth. 
and it's hashtag organized. So even if you're not on a subcommittee, you can still check in and get the lowdown on what being worked on or discussed. In right. China. So that's the city attorney's office. I'm sure that they're going to let us do that, but I will ask. Um, Please do. I think it'll solve a lot of issues. Yeah. And, you know, and to Lisa's like point, like, it popped up and I just thought, oh, I can respond. To Lisa's point, you can see what is happening in other subcommittees. As a as a moderator, you can see and comment on everything. Um, it it and keeps her. It could be just us. It could be the team that needs to approve certain info or keep tabs on that info. So it's not just us. We can widen the circle easily. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, there was two, right? Oh, no. I think level and uh, yeah, no, it would be certainly more than enough for our needs at the free level. Just yeah, we'll we'll try try the just office will let us do that. And I don't know, but I'll ask. I was on my okay. list. Um, In the meantime, we have to watch our subject headers. Please. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Cut me some slack. Ha ha. Ha ha. No, I don't worry. Um, we're good, Diane. I see everybody. More good stuff to come, Diane. <clears throat> yeah, I'm still there. Um, am I okay? Muted? No, yeah, I want to thank everybody for all of the work that they're doing. Um, even you, Chip, even though you think you're not, um, it, it's, it's been amazing. So, um, we do have on the list the inventory review subcommittee and city symbol subcommittee. So, um, Lori, are we just able to share those documents if they have shared via email? Even if we're not going to formally introduce them through this commission meeting? The documents that I prepared for my meeting this morning, I was asked to hold on to because the director is going to be using those. I know oh, that's what I put in my email. I, I was it's I it seems silly because I used the committee's work to put that together. It's not like it's stuff you haven't seen before. But um, no, I can't share that with you right now. I did give I just gave a summary and um, in that email that had the long header, um, okay. there's also a summary. So um, I think that's the best I can do right now. Sorry. I mean, I think you could look at it this way also, of maybe having a little summer downtime from all of your commission <laughs> activities because you've been very, very there busy. You go. So, are we not having subcommittee meetings for a while? I mean, we can, but we need to wait and hear back. We've given them a lot of information to consider. Okay. Like I said, keep thinking about the public participation part. And if you see people that you think might have some thoughts on it, you know, ask them what they they suggest. I mean, okay. you know, certainly keep churning a little bit and thinking about this stuff. But I think a lot of heavy lifting has happened, and now it's with the director, and he needs to start some responses to the work that that you've done. And then um, we'll go from there once he's able to report back to us. Okay. Right. Well, and, and I just want to, oops, I'm not, yeah, I'm not muted. Um, it's nice having a full commission finally after years. Yay. Literally. Lisa, we were, we were fighting for you for like two years, right? Seriously? Wow. I'm thinking, you wow. know, and so in terms of timing and all this stuff going on, it's really great. To have, uh, yeah. to, to it's, have. it's actually chip because Lisa came to <laughs> um, Mark yeah. preliminary prod or Mark's um, um, uh, well, conceptual approval actually. Okay, That's well, I met look, the conceptual the last, the last, it feels like two. The last three months. Have been <laughs> okay, I'll years. give you that. Oh, okay, <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be here. You guys are really, really thoughtful, amazing, creative minds. So I'm excited to learn more about from uh, all of this from all of you. So yeah. So and Brian, of course, for you too. I mean, it's just it's great to just have the whole absolutely the whole shebang. So there you have it. 
Thank and Lisa, you. Lisa, Lori was talking to you and she said, take a break. <laughs> <laughs> on our internal site. Uh. Uh, <laughs> oh, Lord. We're going to see artwork popping up around the city. Yes, and I have Who's artwork. Behind that, well. Lisa? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of irons in the fire, but it's all exciting. Staying busy keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> Oh my. Great, you guys. It's been Thank you. good work, and I'll call for adjournment. All righty, I'll move. A second. Yep. Second. All right, all those in favor? Do I have to do it? Aye. 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 Aye.